the key for me to creativity, to learning, is to listen, to have as your first conscious act the passing across the table of the power keys so that the agenda is set by those on the other side of the table. And if you are willing to put yourself in that position of vulnerability, you stand to benefit massively from the learnings that follow from it, the learnings that come from people from different backgrounds, from different disciplines. So I'm the chief economist uh, at the Bank of England. That's the, the UK's central bank. And as my job title suggests, I mean, the core part of the job is trying to understand the economy. What are the key drivers of the economy? What are the key sectors for generating wealth and job creation uh, in the economy? And of course, those, those factors and those sectors are many and various. Um, but one of the, I'd say, increasingly important of those sectors has been the creative industries sector. I mean, one way of keeping score on that will be to look at this thing called GDP, the amount of value created in the economy. If you look at the value created by the creative industry sector here in the UK, that would be about a hundred billion pounds each year. That's a chunky amount. That's what 5% of the total amount of value created across the UK economy. But of course, I mean, a key point is that that is just really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to really understanding the virtue and the value created by culture, the virtue and value created by the creative industry sector. And the reason I say that is because measures like GDP don't capture any of the non-financial, non-pecuniary benefits that we know are right at the core of the culture sector. We know from all sorts of research and evidence just how much extra well-being, how much happiness is generated by cultural activities of various types. That could be theater, it could be music, it could be sport. These are among the activities that we know generate the largest amounts of personal happiness. And it turns out that you know, the single biggest driver of behavior in the economy, of behavior in the financial system, are the animal spirits embedded within each of us. They are the narratives the stories we tell ourselves about how the world is working. There's now a stream of narrative economics. It's taking the learnings from linguistics and applying them to the words used by people when making sense of their everyday lives and in turn making sense of the way our economies function. So when people think of me as an economist, what do I do as a day job, you know, the popular perception would be that I sit at my desk, I'm pouring through reams and reams of data. I'm an Excel junkie, addicted to my spreadsheets. And of course, a chunk of my job is like that. I do have at my fingertips pretty much every piece of data under the sun on how the economy is working. But that is only around a half of my job, because as important a piece of data comes from the conversations I have, the stories I harvest. So it's, it's very clear, you know, from the, the course of human history, from the course of economic and social history, that the foundation stones of us moving forward as societies, as economies, uh, is, a, is, a, is a coming together. It's a coalescence of a whole multiple range of factors. You might call them capitals. Economists like me often call them capitals. And I use the word capitals plural, because of course I mean things like physical capital, I mean machines, be it spinning jennies in the 18th century or the internet today. And of course I mean um, human capital, that is to say the skills and experiences 
we have as individuals. But crucially, on top of that, I mean social capital, our ability to get along, to build relationships, to build networks, to build friendships, to build trust. It is intellectual capital, the capacity to come up with ideas previously unimagined, often by the bringing together of people from different backgrounds, different disciplines, and different experiences. And overlaying all of this is a final capital. It's institutional capital. It's having the institutional underpinnings that enable people to come together. They could be educational institutions. They could be uh, industrial institutions, uh, like workplaces. Uh, they could be cultural institutions, like theaters uh, and libraries and operas. All of these bits of infrastructure, all of these bits of capital, you need each and every ingredient in that recipe to find the secret source of success societally and economically in the form of well-being and wealth. And if there's one lesson from history, I would say it's that one. Well, in terms of uh, means by which we can do a, a better job of, of uh, unearthing this secret source called creativity, um, I mean, one means uh, of doing that is uh, at the very earliest stage, we know from the evidence that that people, um, on some of the t on some of the measures, you know, people's levels of creativity peak. They peak before they reach the age of ten, uh, and that's telling us something very important uh, about uh, our educational system. Uh, and I think when it comes to the educational system, there is a job to be done over the next several decades in rethinking and perhaps reformulating the way we go about teaching our children. There's a, a very famous, actually the most watched TED talk of all time uh, by Ken Robinson, an educationalist, uh, over a decade old now, was on the theme of schools teaching creativity out of children rather than into children. I think there's a great force in that argument um, we know that one of the crucial factors uh, in stimulating and driving creativity is the capacity to experiment, to try and to fail, and to learn from having failed when you try next time. And the current um, way we structure our schooling and educational system is not well disposed to failure. Uh, the exam system that's at the root of our educational system strongly discourages experimentation, risk-taking, and above all else, failure. Again, and a second um, well-known driver of the creative process is the capacity to take ideas from one discipline, such as epidemiology, and apply it to another discipline let's say, economics. We know that many of the greatest innovations historically, the greatest acts of creativity, have come from the importing of an idea here into a location there. And yet, and yet, our current educational system, not just within schools, but to an extent within colleges and universities, and indeed in the workplace as well, encourages a very high degree of subject specialization. So a curriculum that is overtly cross-disciplinary, I think could also serve as much more fertile soil among both younger people and indeed older ones when it comes to nurturing the, the creative instinct, the creative muscle. Because of creativity, of course, is very far from being God-given. It's something we can be taught. It's a muscle we can develop. It's an instinct we can spot. But it can only play that role if it is a muscle that you, you exercise regularly. Uh, and that's why 
reform educationally. From cradle to grave, I think, is so crucial as one element in a creative transformation. I think the COVID crisis is, um, it, it offers, of course, great challenges and great threats, both to our uh, medical health and to our economic health. Um, but out of this uh, crisis will also be forged new opportunities. So this, this notion of um, creative destruction is a very powerful one. We know that that is the, one of the most important means by which economies and societies move forward. Of course, not all destruction uh, is creative. Um, some destruction is destructive. Uh, and there's no question that the COVID crisis has offered up many examples of that uh, as well. Many theatres or libraries or shops or businesses may be forced to close and not reopen and are at risk of being lost and gone forever in a way that will leave lasting scars. So the key thing, the key thing in policy terms is trying to navigate, walk along this tightrope that on the one hand is seeking to nurture this regrowth, this regeneration, the need for a resurgence in creative endeavor to build back better in the language that's been used, while at the same time not allowing too much of the destructive destruction to tear away at the economic and social and cultural fabric of our economy and of our society. That is the tightrope we are currently walking. I think it calls for policy action to walk that tightrope successfully. You need to create some institutions that can protect society from the downsides, from that destructive destruction. In the same way as in previous times, we set about creating uh, universal health care after the Second World War, or universal education after the dawning of the Industrial Revolution. That was about putting down some institutions, some laying some foundations institutionally that can secure a better and more and less risky society. At the same time, we need to build institutions that can nurture creativity, that can help that regeneration and regrowth. We can start with our schools. We can move through to our universities and colleges. We can take it in to the workplace as we can and should. And we should take it also to our cultural institutions and give them an even more prominent role as one of the key catalysts of creativity. So I think all of that will be needed as part of this reimagining of our economy and of our society. The wellspring of wealth creation and the wellspring of well-being, that is a common source. And that common source, that secret source, uh, is imagination and is creativity. It's the capacity to imagine, to envision a different way of doing things. And then crucially, to set about creating that imagined world. That has been the means by which we've driven forward societies and driven forward economies for many, many millennia. And in a way, you know, the cultural sector and our cultural institutions, you know, are the means of creating those imaginations, that creativity, and the innovation that flows from that and drives society forward. So toggle back 250 years um, to Scotland, to the Scottish Enlightenment movement, a coming together, a crucible of creativity. All manner of disciplines and all manner of individuals coming together and imagining a different sort of society, a different sort of economy. Well, from that crucible of creativity, 
in Scotland in the 18th century was forged the Industrial Revolution, founded in the UK, but whose wealth and practices were then spread globally. And the transformation the Industrial Revolution made to, to our societies has been as great as, as any in, the, in human history. It has been the means by, we, by which we've driven up people's incomes and wealth by many, many multiples. It's been the means by which we've been able to suppress poverty from levels of 90% plus at the start of the Industrial Revolution to less than 10%. Now, at the source of that, at the source of that was culture, was creativity, was imagination. The capacity to imagine a different, a better future then provides the means, the lodestar, through which you can then start moving towards creating that better future. If people have a sense of what better looks like. If a picture can be painted of an uplifting future, then you can work backwards from that to create a plan, to craft a plan between finance ministries and culture ministries and governments and civil society and business that can deliver uh, on that plan. The plan becomes self-fulfilling, the imagined can become real. That is the way historically through which our societies have grown and evolved and developed. And that is never been more so than just at the moment in the light of the COVID crisis. That has brought together, that has brought together all the sectors and segments of society I just mentioned. It's brought together governments. It's brought together business. It's brought together civil society. Uh, and if we can hang on to that spirit of cooperation in forging the sort of plan I've spoken about, the imagine could become real. And that creative spark could turn into a genuine flame that lights up the lights of all the citizens that have suffered so much over the past few months.